Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Ethicon CTS Net Roundtable, powerful innovation in thoracic surgery, then and now. My name is Mark Soberman, and I'm a thoracic surgeon, and I'm senior safety officer at Ethicon. It's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion about surgical stapling, the innovations we've made in stapling over the years, and how that's impacted thoracic surgery for both surgeons and their patients. If our panelists would please introduce themselves. Rob McKenna, thoracic surgeon at John Wayne Cancer Institute in Santa Monica. Shanda Blackman, thoracic surgeon, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Dan Miller, thoracic surgeon, in Atlanta, Georgia. Benny Wexler, thoracic surgeon at the Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh. Thank you again and welcome, panel. Um, when we think of innovation in thoracic surgery, uh, we think about solutions that meet new requirements, create value, and by creating value, we mean decreasing cost and improving outcomes. And to help us better understand the relationships between innovation and thoracic surgery, we have some legacy product here to look at, because um, at the end of the day, seeing is believing. If you want to start with the uh, one on the left. So the first surgical stapler was developed in Hungary in 1908. Hard to believe that was 112 years ago. Uh, and the design was acclaimed. It was quite a breakthrough, but it was bulky and cumbersome and very expensive to manufacture. You could say the same about that 1960s vintage reusable TA stapler there. But you can see we've come a long way since then. So first thing I wanted to ask each of you panelists is um, what are your thoughts about the look and feel of that legacy device? <laughs> quite a difference these days compared to that. Bulky and heavy and very limited. And your access and the way you can get it into, chest, into the chest and do a procedure. Also, too, I think using that, though, when you used it, you knew it was going to work. Very durable. You could clamp on anything. <laughs> Ring forcep, <laughs> lung clamp, so you had to make sure that you weren't doing that. It was very labor intensive to get in, in the room, but it was reliable. You mm -hmm. know, there wasn't a lot of issues with it. The staples always fired very well and so forth. So it was our backbone of our stapling, you know, from the beginning. I think one of the problems with that product was also the loading and unloading, which was a little uh, finicky. And uh, we had to train people. I've used it very little at the beginning of my fellowship, but uh, uh, still fascinates me that uh, this is such a durable device. Absolutely. Um, why don't you guys take a look at the other two? So we've got uh, an early, earlier version of an endo cutter and then uh, a more recent one. Well, just from, just from weight, um, it was, you didn't have to worry so much about focusing on the stapler in your hand. You could actually finally look at what you're dividing and so forth. So that was, that was a big change. Also, too, I think with this, you didn't have to torque as much, you know, going into the chest. As a woman, when I'm doing stapling, if it requires a lot of power to do it, sometimes you have to use two hands, so you're always thinking about that. Um, and, and it's quite bulky. It doesn't rotate very well, very easily, and it doesn't articulate. And so I think your angles have to be perfect in these mm -hmm. cases. And I remember when I went out and took Dr. McKenna's course, we were so close to making sure we got the perfect port site because if you were off by a rib space on your port site with a stapler that didn't have great reticulation, it was critical. Mm -hmm. And so I found that now we can put ports almost anywhere and make it work because the staplers are so advanced nowadays. Using the previous one, it was tricky to figure out how to make an incision big enough and in the right place and how you rotate it around in order to get into the chest. So this is great once we could finally have a smaller incision go straight to the spot, the spot where we wanted to apply the staples. Um, so it was a big advancement. And That's it's also, this is the first device that was made for minimally invasive surgery. <laughs> the old devices were all for open surgery and this one now allows you to work through ports. So I think that was a big advancement. Yeah, and that's what changed minimally invasive surgery, mm -hmm. laparoscopically, thoracoscopically, and so it took you into that next generation of products and also in patient care. Absolutely. Why don't we take a look, quick look at the, the last device, sort of a little more contemporary, and just some thoughts <laughs> about where <laughs> we are at the moment. This certainly was a big advance forward to be able to articulate and have it be smaller. Before my first fat slope, it spent a lot of time figuring out exactly where I would make my incisions, how to get the angle right. Uh, and it took a lot of time to figure that out. 
but like Dr. Blackman said, to be able to just be, it's like horseshoes, if you're in the neighborhood now with the articulation and the other things this can do, you can still compensate for that. So it's nice that we can rotate it, it's nice that it articulates, uh, so certainly these advancements have helped. One of the things about this device that gets me really excited is the fact that this is such a small shaft and it's able to go into a smaller incision. So when you have a smaller incision, now we have this new problem of how do we get the specimen out? <laughs> but squeezing something between the ribs might become obsolete. obsolete. I think in the future probably we'll be doing these microscopic incisions going through with three millimeter staplers or three millimeter mm -hmm. instruments and then doing a sub xiphoid extraction so that we're not really causing the pain or the disruption or even pulling anything or torquing on a rib. But this is so much better. Yeah, the, the one thing that I uh, really enjoy about the staple is that uh, you can operate it with one hand. Um, you know, after you set yourself up, you don't need to be holding it with two hands like previous generation. And sometimes, Shanda, even men had to use two hands to squeeze that, that makes me feel better. device. So <laughs> don't feel too bad. Now, this is a different um, animal in which you could, you could staple with one hand or you can't staple with one hand and have your other hand available to retract or do whatever it is. For example, the single port guys, you know, you have one hand sometimes with a camera, the other hand on the staple or retracting. I think this is a, a, big, um, a big advantage for the surgeon. And I think also too, because when you're teaching residents and you don't want the resident to be focused on squeezing the device or doing that, they've got to focus on the tissue. And so that's, you've got to allow them to trust what they're doing with their hands. And that's very tough uh, to explain that, uh, especially when you're going from an open to a minimally invasive technique. But now a lot of our residents have a lot of laparoscopic experience, so they're getting better at that. But it's a little, a little different in the chest than in the abdomen a lot of times. And, and to your point, Shanda, you know, I think as we see this changing demographic in surgical trainees and in surgeons, you know, that's the, the old men's club is, is uh, changing. And I think that devices have to reflect the people who are using them at the end of the day. So I think it's a very important point that you bring up. Right. So here's an example of uh, peer-reviewed data that was derived from the Premier database um, that looked at advancements in thoracic surgery and its impact on patient care. Ethicon has uh, invested in and will continue to invest in generating real-world evidence from sources like the Premier Database, to, as one example. That, um, now that we have data like this, um, how has that impacted your practice, uh, your institutions, um, as uh, we see advances in surgical devices? Um, how does that influence, or that, how do those data influence your decisions when you're trying to figure out what technologies, what innovations to bring into your institution and your practice? When I bring a new device into the hospital, it's very difficult as a surgeon to introduce and advocate for a new device without having some data to show that it increases the speed or that it makes the surgery safer or that it makes me more accurate as a surgeon or that it's less expensive or that it translates into something that benefits the patient and it's even better if it benefits the hospital as well. When new devices are brought out, it's not necessarily better if it's new. It might be no different. But as a surgeon, to advocate for the new technology, having the ability to really demonstrate that it's better is very important to me. And I don't think I can bring things in without that evidence. I think that the most important um, aspect when you're looking at total care, and the big thing when we're looking at staplers and, and cost, and you're trying to get a certain stapler into your OR and they want to know how much it's going to cost and so forth. And if it's, you know, powered stapler that can cut down complications and so forth, that's going to save money. It's going to save money for the total hospital. But when the hospital is not working with the OR, there's different silos. They don't communicate to each other. So, oh, I want this stapler. It's going to, you know, it's, it might be $50 more expensive than what the other uh, competitor is, but if you look at the bottom line, it's gonna save you money in the long run. But they don't talk to each other to do that. But also too, I think as we look at our own, your own data, 
in at our institution, you can look at your cost data per case. But also the real world data mm -hmm. allow you to go away from unitary cost. Uh, meaning, when I get um, real world data in terms of cost, it's easier for me to convince my administrators, whatever silos they are, that paying those extra $50 mm -hmm. will be advantageous at the final cost of care. Uh, and I think that that's what uh, real, real world data, such as a prime database and, and, and similars, will, will give us um, for particular uh, devices and will help us introduce new technologies and convince our administrators that we need those new technologies and at the end they may lower cost of care. Some of the things that the sales force tells us really don't matter very much to me. They're, they're technical engineering issues and just because they say something that doesn't necessarily translate into real benefit or is it necessarily very important to me. But things like bleeding, if you can show us that there's lower incidence of bleeding, that's important in a lot of levels. That can shorten the length of stay, it can reduce the cost by not needing to transfuse patients. Uh, and from the, the point of view of a cancer patient, you transfuse somebody and you're going to lower their uh, survival rate. So things like that are really important and make a difference to the patient, make a difference to administration, and I think help our operations be better. I think based on the data, we'll make most of our big decisions. We'll be able to take all of the factors that you talked about earlier and incorporate them into one decision algorithm. We'll have machine learning patterns that will help us to select our staplers based on hemostasis, length of stay, safety, cost, quality, usability, mm -hmm. fatigue of the surgeon, mm -hmm. learnability, feedback, the smartness of the device. I think all of these will play a huge role. And the smarter we get at making our decisions rather than an arbitrary mm -hmm. A, B, C, the better we'll be able to give our, give our patients the best care. And I think the key is too, the surgeon has to be open to read the data, understand the data, mm -hmm. and then apply it to their patients. Right. And that's where there's been that wall that hasn't occurred. Now hopefully, because of a broad you know, spectrum that was done across the country and so forth, that will happen. A lot of times it's by competition though. Oh, I heard so-and-so is using the stapler. <laughs> I guess I better start using it too. But that, a lot of times, that was not data. But now this is data that can drive that, so you can change. I think to summarize, it's really it's about data that will benefit patients. Uh, it's not about the engineering and the technical price of the device itself, but uh, how is that going to change what we do and how is that going to change our outcomes and the cost data to allow us to introduce it. Absolutely. Creating value mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Where do you see the future of thoracic surgery uh, going forward to help your practice and help your patients? I think uh, using energy has been a tremendous advancement in what we do in the chest and so do a, a combination of, of stapling and energy at the same time. So if we can combine instruments that we have now and knowledge, I think it would be very beneficial. I think smaller instruments, mm -hmm. smarter instruments, more helpful instruments, more repeatable, reliable, less user dependent mm -hmm. instruments are going to translate into real new technology. In the future, if I could design anything, I think having the ability to track the instruments as they go in and out of the abdomen or the chest, wherever you're using them, and to be able to get real feedback on a pattern, you know, perhaps if the dissection's taking longer or if the stapler's, you know, going into the right direction or the wrong direction, mm -hmm. you know, there, there will be virtual augmented reality as we operate. Mm -hmm. And these devices will be guiding us. So eventually you'll have so much assistance, mm -hmm. you might not really even need the contemporary setting that you right. have right now. In terms of thoracic surgery, I think we're going to do less uh, surgery as we understand it today and more or official surgery um, through different technologies. Uh, I believe that staplers are going to become smaller and smarter and just like uh, driver assisting devices in a car they will take some of the um, experience required to use them um, and perhaps communicate back to the surgeon you know maybe that's the wrong load maybe you should compress longer or maybe 
um, you know, it, it is the right load, go ahead and fire, and fire in a way that will be predictable and reproducible no matter whose surgeon is, who, you know, what the experience of the surgeon using it. So one last question, actually. Um, as we think about innovation, as we think about data and evidence, as we think about uh, stapling technology, anything that we haven't touched on or anything that I haven't asked you that you wish we had included in the conversation today? I'd like to see the staplers to be smarter than they are right now, <laughs> that they've got, I've wanted for a long time to have ultrasound to help you see where the surface of a vessel is and to help you dissect around that. Um, to, just like we have navigational bronchoscopy, if we'd have navigational mm -hmm. staplers to help get around and do the dissections and be in the right place safely. Also too, I think, which we haven't spoke about, is the patient, not in regards to their outcomes, but in selecting their devices. Because when someone has a heart valve, they've done a lot of homework on which mm -hmm. valve they want for stroke risk and so forth. And so it's kind of interesting <laughs> right. that, yeah. As that goes in the future, say, well, I want, I want that powered stapler instead of a manual stapler because, I, you know, in the data that was presented, that it makes a difference in their recovery. So that might be something that will come on down the road. I would personally love to see a fusion of larger databases so that they can be joined together. I think one of the missed opportunities is being able to mix a surgeon-specific database that has granular data with something like the Premier database. I think fusing those two and having longitudinal survival data would give us tremendous value in the ability to really equitably evaluate different technologies. Okay, well, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon, and thank you all at home.